All right, if you got your Bibles, here we go. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, we're starting a new series. It's going to be brief. We're going to get back to 1 Samuel. If you've been coming and listening to those messages, we're going to dive back into that after we're done these next uh, three or four weeks. Uh, but uh, I thought it was important for us to have a time to be reminded of how important it is if we follow God and want to be like God to be generous as he is generous. Last week we uh, uh, were studying uh, in 1 Samuel these, these three men, Eli and then Hophni and Phinehas. Eli's dad, Hophni and Phinehas, were sons of Eli. They were all priests in this place called Shiloh serving in God's temple, and they were not doing a good job. That's putting it mildly. Uh, and so we... we uh, uh, encountered them last week in 1 Samuel chapter 2, being um, rebuked and prophesied against. Uh, God sent a messenger. He didn't have a name, still doesn't. But uh, uh, he was sent to these uh, Eli and to his sons to, to pronounce God's judgment over their choices. But he starts with a history lesson. He says, you know what? Everything that you are, all that you have has been given to you by God. You did nothing to become who you are, to, to be uh, in, the, in the space that you're in and, and hold the, the position that you hold. It's the blessing of God, the grace of God. And we left here last week, hopefully, remembering that when someone asks us how we're doing, our answer is better than we deserve. That's right. Because all of us are. And some of you are like, I don't know, Mark. You don't know how my day is going so far. Here's what I do know. It's hard, as difficult as whatever season is that you're in, you deserve worse. I'm sorry to put it that way, but that's just the truth. If we understand who we are and who God is, he's righteous and holy. We are not. And so what we have uh, been uh, given in life has been given to us by him. Uh, so it's only fitting that as we talked about the fact that we receive more than we deserve from God, we should talk about how we steward what he has given us. Let me establish an all-important truth. It's a thread that's going to kind of be woven through all of these sermons. Uh, I'm preaching this message, not because the offerings are down. Just, you know, all, that's why he's doing this. We don't follow the numbers, but we must be in a dip, all right? Uh, I'm, I'm praising God that he has always provided for his church here. Uh, when COVID hit, our offerings went up. What's up? How's it going? Nobody came. Offerings went up. We're going to shut down. Uh, just, you know, every, I'm just kidding. Uh, 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 God's always taking care of us. I'm blessed to be able to, you know, tell you that we're a church that's out of debt. Uh, we, uh, you know, are, are blessed by those who give. Thanks for being generous. And we've always stayed within our means as a church. We're not overextended. And so don't take your foot off the gas and stop giving, but I'm not, I'm not preaching because we're in trouble. Okay. That's not the sermon that I'm preaching today. In fact, I'm preaching because generosity goes way beyond the amount given or the uh, you know, the, the machinations of giving. It's about a heart and a mindset that those who follow God are meant to have. Amen. Generosity, this is something I want you to remember as we talk about it, is what God wants for you and not just from you. Does everybody get that? God wants generosity to be a part of you. It's who he is, and so he wants it to be who we are in life. So I'm not going to talk about measures and metrics today. Maybe we'll get into that in some of the other passages as we study. But I want to talk about your mindset. More importantly, your heart. What needs to be in those places if you're going to be generous in life? Let's start by correcting some false ideas. Uh, if a poll were taken, uh, and as I read on some websites, and, and, and Americans were asked, do you think you're rich? Most Americans don't feel rich. Guess what? We are. 100% we are. And you're like, well, I'm, I'm not Bezos rich. I'm not Elon rich. And, and that's our problem. If we have this picture of ourselves as, as not being blessed, we are among, listen, look at me, we are among the most blessed peoples of history here in this country. Everybody gets that, right? Not just, you know, uh, you know being Americans, but being alive at this time in America. Even as inflation rates go crazy, and I know everybody's watching the news and, you know, costs uh, double what it did to rent a place in our area. I get it. Things are more expensive, but we still are blessed beyond what we deserve, certainly, and really beyond what we can measure. If we, if we look up at Bezos and Elon, sure, we're going to feel poor. I don't got Amazon money, do you? But if we look back... And, then, and, and, and put ourselves in the perspective of all the ways that God has blessed us, we're, we're rich beyond. Yeah, uh, who drove here this morning? Anybody driving a car today? 
Now, you may not have it all paid off. You might be working towards that. But uh, if you drove today in a car, you're among the 6 to 10% highestly, or mo- highestly, that's not even a word, most affluent uh, people in the world. Only 6 to 10% of the people in the world own their own vehicle. Everybody else walks or rides the bus or whatever. Now, so you're going to get in those cars, most of you, after you're done. And uh, you're going to, you know, crank them on and, and you're going to drive out of here. Uh, you're going to head home and, and probably have a decent lunch, unless you're dieting or fasting or whatever. But uh, you got food in your fridge. And there's a good chance you're going to throw out some of that food in your fridge. Because it's just, you don't need it all. You can't possibly, you know, fill your face with it fast enough. Others uh, among us will get in our cars and we'll drive to a restaurant. We'll drive past 10 or 12 perfectly good restaurants, they're not the one we like, to get to the one that we like and then we're going to be a little bit miffed that we have to wait five minutes because after all, this is America, I'm the customer. And then we're going to sit down in an air-conditioned space and people are going to walk up to us and give us food. Now we're going to pay for it and hopefully you'll tip generously as a result, right? Right? But then you'll walk back out and you'll think nothing of it. That's normal. For most of the world, that is vacation. We are blessed. You're going to take that car from that restaurant and you're going to drive it back to your house. And you're going to push this button that's on your visor and a magical door will begin to lift. And it'll open up and you'll pull that car into your car house. Have you ever thought about that? We call them garages, maybe because we're so embarrassed by our riches. But that's a car house. Most people don't have a car, let alone a car house. And I've been abroad. Most people's houses aren't as big as your car house. Okay, is that enough? We're rich, even though we don't feel that way. Most Americans think they're generous. Another lie. They're not. Americans, statistically, are not generous people. Now, you may be, in fact, I know, listen, I'm sitting, or you're sitting, I'm standing, yes, I'm standing in front of people who are sitting in here who I know give generously. I I know you, I've been your pastor for 18 years, thank you, I'm so grateful for you. But, you know, overall, Americans just aren't generous people. The average uh, giving for the average American per year is about 2.8%, okay? That's, and, and, you know, in in most uh, polls, why do you give? To get the tax benefits of giving. I only give so that I can't lose more money. It's beneficial to me for me to give, right? Now, some of you hear that, and well, you know, I'm sure the richer people are more generous than that. No, the more you make, the less you give. If you earn over $100,000 as a household, the number goes down, 2.6%. The rich stay richer, right? Yeah, uh, which leads to this question. Why don't people give more? Why aren't people more generous? It's an easy answer. Why don't people do anything that God commands them to do or hopes for them to do or has designed them to do? They just don't want to. I don't want to give. It's like in us to keep, not give. More, more, more. Mine, mine, mine. We're like the two-year-olds next door who want every toy in the classroom that they're in. Have you you watched this unfold? You don't have to teach people to be greedy. Two-year-olds understand, right? We have to teach them to what? Share. Because they're default program is keep and it stays with us and we get you know kind of stingy in the weirdest ways like like I've gone into Publix anybody been to a a grocery store and they say hey would you like to round up your purchase today to whatever dollar amount so that you can give to this cause or that cause or hey do you want to give five dollars we'll put your name on a shamrock and smack it here on our register or something like that anybody been to these things okay I don't know about you when they ask me that hard no no so you're like, wow, that's disappointing, Mark. I thought you were spiritual. Uh, yeah, listen, I got all kinds of reasons for that. I don't know who I'm giving to. I don't know what the cause is. I don't, you know, and listen, we, we'll, we'll talk about that as we go further in this series. You certainly have to be wise in, in, in your, you know, using of God's uh, resources and stewarding what he gives. I'm not saying just be, yeah, you know, but, but here's, here's what I, as I kind of like drilled down deeper into why I did that, it's mostly because I just don't want to give. It's like two bucks. And for me, God, you know, thank you, two bucks is not that big a deal at this stage of life. So why is it that? So I'm, I'm not saying you'll be holier if you give it public, so I'm not saying that, but, but I'm saying it just creeps up on us. I don't want to give, and it's just in there. 
I remember a few years ago, same Publix, right over here. I'm walking in the Publix, and there's that, that sports team. Has anybody seen? They, they post up outside the entrances of these things. You know, Christmas time, it's the guy with the bell. But, you know, at different times, some baseball team wants to go to Cooperstown, and they think you can help, right? And so I'll confess, I do the wide arc. Who does the wide arc on that one? Anybody do the wide arc? <laughs> Let all the other shoppers go on on that side of the door. The kids will talk to them. I'll be over here. I'll just kind of slide in the, you know. And then as I come out, same deal. I'm slide, and, and I'm doing the wide arc on the way out. Why? I just don't want to, uh, I don't want your popcorn, and I don't want to give you money. <laughs> I remember one time a few years ago I went in there, and um, as God continues to sift the, the coals of the fire of my life with him, and uh, at times challenged me in areas like this, generosity, on this particular occasion I went in there, and, and I locked eyes with the kid on the way in. Just don't do that, right? That's just, <laughs> you know, it's like the dog adoption commercials. You're just like, come on, seriously? I mean, all right. And so I locked eyes with him, but I quickly turned away, did my wide arc, and I, I got in there. And, and at this particular time, it's not every time, but at this particular time, God spoke to me uh, as, as we were just kind of walking through the aisles, just picking up all the stuff for me, 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 me. And he says, uh, hey, Mark, Really? You don't got 10 bucks so this kid can go play, play, play baseball at Cooperstown and can't get that in? He's like, why don't you give him that money? I was like, all right, you know. So I come back out. I don't do my wide arc. I walk right up to the kid who looked at me because he had switched sides. Anyway, uh, <laughs> he knew he had me. They, they know. And, uh, and I said, hey, buddy, here's 10 bucks. I don't need your popcorn. Just have a great day. And I'm walking, you know, uh, out of the store past this kid. He said, thank you. And as I'm starting to cross the, the street there, I, I hear his mom, I'm guessing, who's back at the table, and she says, thank you, Pastor Mark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you guys don't even know. All right. Uh, I don't tell that story uh, because I think you should give in case someone's watching. In fact, the Bible's real clear. Don't care about who sees you give. In fact, don't let your right hand know what the left hand is doing. It's hyperbole. It should be in secret. We don't give for show. Um, but it just reminded me. That was God's way of reminding me. Hey, man, generous is good. Generous is good. So a lot of people don't give because they don't want to. I pray that's not you. Maybe you fit into this category. Your heart's right. It's just your budget's off. You don't give or you aren't as generous as you could because you don't think you can. And we're going to talk about this in this series. Um, God has um, hopes for how we organize our lives. I'm not talking about your kitchen cupboards. I'm talking about the priorities that you and I have in life. He wants to be first. If you haven't picked that up from what I've been putting down as I preach, God wants to be prominent and preeminent in your life. He, he wants to be first. He deserves to be first. And if we have a hard time giving, it's, it's probably, it could be because just our outlay has just so, you know, through whatever calamity or whatever, exceeded our, our income that we, we just, and listen, I'm not saying that you can't have seasons where uh, maybe you give less and stuff like that. I'm not going to talk to you about percentages and you're holy if you give this much and not holy if you give this much. But what I hear most of the time when I talk to people who would love to give is that um, they just don't think they can. So, again, another uh, common um, comment that I'll make through this series is just start. Just start. Like, God wants us to be generous. Just start. Wherever you can, begin. Did anybody think I could do some push-ups? Here they come, Daniel. I'm going to do some push-ups right here. Count them off with me. Here we go. One, two, three, four, okay, I could do way more, but... Uh, <laughs> That feels like enough. Oh, thank you. Yes. Uh, we went to Crunch this morning for church. It was great. Crunch gym. Anyway, uh, I really can't do that many more than five, okay? Uh, I'd love to be able to do more. Some of you are slim good bodies out there, and you can just rattle these things off like they're nothing. I used to be able to do that when I was a younger guy. Can't right now, but guess what? If I ever want to get back up to 50 and 75 and sometimes 100 in a row, guess what I'm going to have to do? 
more. I'm going to have to start with five, and I'm going to have to progress towards whatever that goal is of mine to be able to do them all. Are you with me? I hope that makes perfect sense to you all when it comes to giving. You just start. You don't have to, you know, hit your mark on the first day. Just begin to be generous. And, and I'm not just talking about giving to a church, our church, any church. I'm talking about just your mindset in life. I'm going to be generous. I'm going to start today. Here we go. And do your push-ups. I'm thankful that I was uh, blessed to marry the woman that I married. I was not a giver when she met me. Uh, one of our first phone calls, we were both young believers, and uh, so we were talking about just, you know, life in general, and she made this comment. Oh, I just got paid. She worked at the snack uh, bar dining area of our college, and she said, oh, I just got paid. i got to remember to tithe, and I remember as a, a, a 20-year-old, her you know, 20-year-old boyfriend being like, you tithe? You give? And, and, and she was on the other end of the phone going like, you don't, right? And so uh, uh, that was the beginning of our... Uh, uh, you know, uh, giving conversations. And, and, uh, and so thankfully, she, she's always been God's uh, agent in, in my being generous. And, and we've kind of caught up to each other and we're, we're both okay with it now and love being generous and want to learn how to be more. But uh, uh, our first year of marriage, I made uh, $16,000. That was our take-home pay for the two of us. We lived in subsidized housing. Uh, uh, and, and, and we gave like the first thing we did with every check is we gave whatever the, you know, the tithe was on sixteen thousand dollars, and uh, and and that was what we did. And and for thirty-two years, by God's grace, we've always given. Why? We started doing push-ups. We just did what we needed to do, knew to do at the time we were doing it, and and it's just just it's become a part of who God's made us to be as a family. Um, so that's the good news. If if you're not given, um, you can learn to, and you can start. But, but let, let me go a little bit deeper into why you're not giving. Most of the people who aren't giving or aren't in the, in the pattern of generosity, they, they don't think they can because they have this never enough mindset. They just don't have enough. And here's how this basically works. It's a cycle. God gives everything we have. Everybody look at me. Everything we have, God gives. I know you go to work, and I know you put in a, you know, a, a hard day's good day's work, and you earn a check and stuff like that. But you have that job. You have your abilities to work. You live in America. You were born when you were born all by the grace of God. Is everybody with me? So God gives you all that you have, and then your first move with what God has given you is to consume. If you're having a, if you're having a hard time being generous, it's because probably uh, your money has to go all these other places that it has to go. Now, there's certain things, bills, who's got them? Anybody got a couple bills? Yep, we got them. So we have to pay these bills to live the way that we live and live where we live and all that stuff, and those bills are going up, inflation's taking things higher. I get all that, but then there's the, the, the income that we use just for the stuff that we want. They're not necessary things. They're just the things that we decide we, we, we want in life. And so we consume all of that, doing whatever it is that we do. And then uh, we find out that there's more month than our check. And we lack. And no one likes to lack. No one likes to be in this position where I don't have it. And so what that breeds in us is fear. How am I going to, and, and not just how am I going to give, that, that's like not even something on our radar. We're like, how am I going to make this end meet or this end meet because I haven't been wise in ordering uh, what God has given me in the pattern that he desires. God doesn't want us to live in fear. God doesn't want us to live in lack. God wants us to order things the way that he designed. So with the rest of our time today, let's walk through one of the passages in our scriptures that helps us understand generosity the way God sees it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, Paul is writing probably uh, for the fourth time. There's, I don't have time to get into that. That's bonus material. No other service got that. Well done. Uh, but this is uh, a later letter. He's been uh, writing often to this church. They've had lots of things to work on. And so the, for the first eight chapters, he's talking to them about the various things that are you know, currently happening in their, uh, uh, their church culture and the things that they need to be careful of. And now in chapter 9, he progresses into talking about generosity. He opens it with this conversation. Hey, y'all, you know that all the churches in this age are uh, seeking to be generous to the churches that are especially persecuted. The church in Jerusalem was one of them. There was other churches that uh, uh, the, the, the place where they were living, it was, it was just hard to be a Christian there. Uh, not just 
hard because the government's coming down on you, but because they were being shunned in the business world. No one was buying their goods. Everybody was against them. They just had no way to provide for themselves. And so the other churches that weren't as persecuted were giving so that these churches could have. And it talks about, I'm not going to read all the verses, but it talks about a church in Macedonia. That's the church of Philippi, if you ever read Philippians. They were super generous. You can read about their generosity in that letter. Uh, but Paul says, hey, man, I already told the guys from Macedonia that you guys are just as generous as they are. And essentially, he says this, don't let me down. Don't let yourselves down. Don't let me down. And to help you be generous like you've said you would be, uh, I'm sending some of my team ahead of me to, to help you in preparing this gift that's going to help the persecuted church of the first century. It says it this way in verse 5, so I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to go on ahead to you and arrange in advance for the gift you have promised so that it may be ready as a willing gift, like a true gift. Like here, we're happy to do this and not as an exaction. That's a word we don't use all the time. It just means it's an obligation or as a bill, right? Uh, Paul says, don't think of the persecuted church as spectrum or Verizon. Uh, this is not just something you have to do. It's something you get to do. And then he goes on and he's, he, he writes down some of the most widely quoted scriptures about giving in our Bibles. We're starting here first because Maybe you've heard them. And uh, the first, he's going to tell us three things, but the first thing he's going to tell us is get crazy with the seed toss. I took that from Beck, all you people who grew up in the 90s, crazy with the cheese whiz, nobody. Anyway, all right, get crazy with the seed toss. Crazy with the seed toss. He says this, he goes to the farm and he says, listen, the point, verse 6, is this. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. He's like, you guys get this. And they did. Everybody in that uh, time would have either understood farming, having grown up on their own family's farm. Most people back then were subsistence gardeners, at least, if not farmers. They would grow their own food. And, and there's just principles that go to planting uh, and reaping. If you plant a bunch of seeds, there's a better chance that you'll have a greater harvest. I didn't have seeds, so I went into my desk drawer, and I found pennies. Has anybody got a bunch of pennies just sitting in some cabinet or some compartment of your drawer? So, so, so here's the picture. We'll use pennies as seeds. Um, if you do this, like occasionally give, like I'll give, you know, once a month or, uh, you know, at, at Easter, uh, and, and, and then when you give, you just give a little bit, and you're only getting one. Well, how's this garden going to grow? Anybody want to know? Well, are we going to have a hard time keeping it under control? No. There's just not a lot there to grow from, right? And so Paul tells the Corinthians, hey, y'all, when it comes to giving, don't just be you know, tossing one seed every you know, couple of months. Just not a lot's going to come from that. They understood, just like Jesus did when he was given the parable of the sower. He talks about these three soils where it doesn't work, but then he talks about this one soil where the seed, the gospel that is planted in the heart of that person will bring forth a harvest that's 30, 60, 100 times and what they had been planted with. That, that's, that's not Jesus just making up numbers willy-nilly. They knew back then that if they planted one seed of wheat, that wheat seed could uh, you know, shoot up into this stock that would provide them 30 seeds, 60 seeds, 100 seeds. The more you plant then, the greater the chance of yield. So get crazy with the seed toss. But we need to answer this question. Why don't people just get crazy with it? Why, do, why are people sowing so sparingly? Well, most of the time it's because of that first thing we talked about. They want to keep the seed. This is mine. I earned it. It's for me. I'm going to need it. I'm going to hoard it, or I'm going to pour it into all these possessions that don't fit in my house, so I have to get uh, a storage space for them. Has, has anybody noticed this, the, the sheer number of storage facilities that are going up in our world? I'm like, seriously, Americans? You can't fit it in the 4,000 square foot house you have, so you've got to pay for an apartment for your stuff? Because people think, I need it. Of course, that's why. This is what you get, and that's it. But others have done what I've told you uh, happens in the never enough. They've already, they've already eaten this. Did you know that some crops, not some, several crops, 
um, depend on their, the fruit of the harvest to be the seeds for the next. Everybody gets that, right? Do I have to explain that? Has anybody been to science? That's how vegetables work. You, you go into your vegetables uh, and, and find the seeds and the fruits or the vegetables. Uh, a lot of times, I worked in the potato fields growing up, and, uh, and they would actually take potatoes and just cut them up, and those cuttings would become the seeds for the next year's uh, you know, sowing. So potato farmers get this. Don't eat all your potatoes. You're going to need some for the next crop. But so many people live their lives. They're like, oh, good, I got some seeds. <laughs> And they just consume, they get all cookie monster on that thing, and they consume it all for themselves. And there's no seeds left. Conversely, he says, whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. That's not saying that our motivation should be to receive. We don't give so as to receive. Some churches preach that. It's called the prosperity gospel. If you give to me, I'll send you my sweaty handkerchief, says this one preacher on TV. And God will, you know, three times, four times bless you. Listen, I believe that God is, <laughs> no, one, no one can outgive God, all right? God is no man's debtor. He will bless you. It may not be monetarily, all right? So don't think of this as some kind of get rich scheme. If I give God some money, he'll triple it, all right? But God will take our generous hearts and whatever we choose to give him, materially and otherwise, and he will bring a harvest from it. And the more we give, the more he harvests, the more that comes from that investment. The picture that we have, I've been waiting for this service all weekend because I finally get to do what I've been wanting to do with these pennies. The picture of anybody in the farming world is this. You take a whole handful of seeds and you just start chucking. Sorry, maintenance team. Anyway, uh, <laughs> oh, it's horrible. You just take the seed and you throw it. Uh, joyfully, hopefully, asking God for a, a huge harvest. How are some people able to sow so bountifully? These, you got to get these. If you don't get anything else, get these two. The first thing, especially when it comes to being generous with God, is that they understand the, the things that I'm sowing are not mine. It's not my seed. And some of you are like, good point, Pastor. When we give to God, those, those things that we give to God are his, and that's what we should do. We should just return them to him. Great point. No, you weren't listening to me. Nothing that we have is ours. Not just the stuff we give. Here, Lord, these, this is yours. No, everything that is ours is his. And so if I can get to the point where I understand in my head, not mine, his, Giving gets easier. Here's, here's my, here's, I'll prove it. If you came in this morning and uh, you, you were going to sit down where you sat down, but there was someone in your row and you weren't sure, were they saving seats for their whole family? What did you do? You did what Americans do everywhere. Hey, are these seats taken, right? And because they hadn't reserved them for someone else, they easily said this, no, go right ahead. Uh, hopefully you did that unless you're a real jerk. Anyway, uh, um, no, go ahead. Why? Not my chairs. Just so you know, I know many of you are sitting in the same chair. You always sit in here. Newsflash, not your chair. That's our chair. It's God's chair, but it's our church's chair. You sit there. Glad you're there every week. I know if you're here or not. Thanks for coming. All right? But it's not your chair. And we, we're that way with stuff that's not ours. Have it. Who cares? Take it. It's not mine. Right? Like how many of you <laughs> have borrowed a tool from one of your neighbors and another neighbor comes and says, hey, can I use that trimmer? You're like, fine, it's Gary's. Go ahead, take it. I don't care. <laughs> it's not mine. It's not my say-so because it's not mine. People who sow bountifully know that the seed that they've been given, it's not theirs. It was given to them by the grace of God through the last harvest, and here we go again. <laughs> People who are able to sow bountifully know it's not their seed. They also are harvest-focused over seed-focused. That's, that's a huge distinction. Because people who are in this never-enough mindset, they're, they're focused on, oh, I've got to keep this. And if I don't hold on to the seed, I, I won't have what I require. But Jesus tells this parable about these servants, right? They were given these uh, investments called talents, and, uh, and two of them took what the master had given and, and went out and invested it. They let it go. They sowed it. And it became more in return. And when the master came back, they were able to report of their, uh, you know, their, their increase. 
God had, you know, uh, blessed him. And the master conferred his, uh, his commendations on him. But there was one guy who said, no, I'm going to keep what's been given to me. I'm going to bury it in my backyard. And the master came back and, and saw that servant. He's like, what are you doing? I gave you this as an investment. And you did nothing with it. All you did was hoard and keep. Hmm. People who sow bountifully, they understand it's not mine. And they look forward to the harvest. They, they're giddy about seeing what God's going to do with this. I don't know what's going to happen, but here we go. <laughs> now, the next verse is one of the more famous verses in the church when it comes to giving because it gives basically the template. This is how you give. God says through Paul to the Corinthians, give generously according to a cheerful plan. It says this in verse 7, each one must give as he has decided in his own heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let's just walk through each one of those phrases. First one is this, where we learn that generosity is expected. What are the first four words of that verse? Each one must give. Now, the, 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 the part that we like in this verse is the next part willingly, cheerfully. And, and in fact, my implication here is that if I'm not willingly and cheerfully giving, I don't have to give. Problem solved. I'll never willingly or cheerfully give, therefore I'm exempt. We love those condition clauses, right? Fine print. I found it. No, you didn't. Paul's expectation of everybody in Corinth is that they would give. Each one must give. Full stop, let it soak in. If you follow God, he's generous. If you want to be like him, you're generous too. The next phrase says this. We're taught that generosity needs to be premeditated. We should give as we have decided in our own hearts to give. And so without it becoming this big percentage war, I should give this much or this much, we should pray. And as God leads us to give, all of us are given. But as God leads us to give, we're going to give the way that he leads us to give. And it's going to require us to think ahead of time so that that's possible uh, in our lives. Now, this might surprise you. I was getting ready to preach a message on generosity, and I, I noticed my bank account numbers were off. Has anybody ever done that? And you're like, why is this off? And, and so I went in, and, and recently, about a month and a half ago, two months ago, uh, the credit card that we have tied to most of our bills expired, and so I went into everything that I thought I could remember to make sure it was up to date and, and that everything would continue you know, without a hitch, but guess what I forgot to change? The giving to Baylife Church. So I was about to preach this message to you about giving, and I hadn't given to our church in two months. How's it going? I figured it out. I paid it all back. Everybody settle down. All right. Uh, I love giving online because I know as soon as my paycheck hits the, the bank, the next thing that happens Bill-wise or payment-wise, I shouldn't call it a bill, but, but the next thing that happens in the stewarding of my money is I give. The next day, my check, my whatever card payment goes to Bay Life Church. And, and, and here's why that for me is so significant. You don't have to do it that way. You do whatever God wants you to. But for me, that's significant because the Bible tells us to bring our first fruits, to bring the primary, the first to our God. And I love that the first thing that comes out of whatever God paid me is my gift to him, Right? But I hadn't done that for two months and need to straighten that out. Uh, maybe it's been a while since you gave. Maybe you, you don't have a plan. That's why uh, as a never enough giver, you're just like, well, whatever I got left over, here you go. And, and what God wants us to do is to have a plan. I, I always taught people and was taught when I was coming up that uh, you, you give 10% to God, you, you save 10% where it's possible, and you live off of the rest, 80%. This is not the Bible says so stuff. It's just a, a, a suggestion. Give, save, live, right? So figure out your numbers. If you're not giving at all, start doing some push-ups. Throw something in there. If you're not saving at all, I encourage you. I'm not a financial planner. But, you know, saving, paying for stuff with cash, if possible, is better than paying for stuff with credit. Are you with me? But then figure out how can I live off whatever the rest is. And that's how you start. It's a plan. Everyone should give. Each one of us should give. As God has led us, as, as we've decided in our own hearts, not reluctantly or under compulsion, generosity, generosity should not be a drudgery. Oh, here we go. In fact, that's what happened with some of you. 
<laughs> as I started preaching this message. I couldn't see it because it's dark in here, uh, but your, your eyes rolled just a little bit, right? Like, <sighs> you were like me in middle school. I was a, uh, a young uh, seventh grader, whatever, 12, 13 years old. And where I lived in northern Maine, they would let our school out uh, for three weeks, four, sometimes four, in, in September and October to go pick potatoes in the potato field. We were the, we were the workforce. And, and we'd go out and we'd, we'd, we'd bend over and scoop up potatoes that had been dug up on the ground, throw them in a basket, put them in a barrel. We got paid 50 cents a barrel. Oh, my gosh, we were just so rich. And so uh, at the end of those three or four weeks, I'd make four, $500 maybe. And at the end of, of that, that earning cycle, our church had this program called the Harvest Offering. Okay? And it was this discipleship program designed to teach young people like myself who have gone out and had their first taste of working what it's like to give and to tithe. And so my mom let me know, um, hey, uh, just so you know, you're going to give a tenth of what you just earned uh, to God on Sunday. There's going to be this big thing. You're going to walk up with that check in your hand or dollars in your hand, and you're going to throw it in this basket. And I said, no, I'm not. <laughs> and she's like, well, yes, you are. And I did not, can anybody picture me, 12-year-old me, walking up with this envelope and kind of slow, you know. This is not the picture that God has of giving. It's a get-to, it's not a got-to. It's something that we do because he's blessed us and we should look forward to blessing him back. I go to this uh, restaurant in Sefner called Martha's and... uh, uh, there's this one servant, uh, someone after last service told me, her name is Debbie, uh, but I didn't know that. Debbie uh, is often uh, serving my table, and she is just a, a basket of joy. Does anybody have, have ever had, like, I look forward to Debbie serving me my food. She, she calls me baby and darling. What you need, baby? I'll get that right up for you, darling. I don't know why I love that. I love that. I feel like oh, I'm in, you know, I'm in Debbie's house. And, uh, uh, she brings me my food, and it, it, this Friday night, I, we took a couple there for dinner, and they're open for dinner on Fridays, and, and we had our, uh, Debbie, it was Debbie's day, it was, it, it, so I'm just so excited the whole time, I'm thanking her after every time she comes to the table, she just lights up my life, and so it came time for the tip, right, and I was like, you know, normally I, I'm a pretty, you know, fairly generous tipper or whatever, but I'm just like, I'm going crazy, Here, here's, you know, here's just this bunch of money, and I joyfully gave to Debbie for the way that she had so completely served uh, and honored us at our meal, right? And I got, I'm driving home and I'm thinking, well, that's what generosity is. Because who has served us more than the God who creates us and sustains us and provides everything for us? And why would I joyfully give to Debbie and not give to him? Don't do it begrudgingly. Do it cheerfully. That It's a a hilarious experience, for God loves a cheerful giver. That Greek word, cheerful, is the Greek word hilaros, from whence we get hilarious. Isn't this great? We get to give. Hmm. Paul goes on and he finishes with these encouragements, because he can probably sense as he's saying this to his readers in Corinth, they're just like, I don't know, Paul. I just don't know. I know you want us to give. I know it's right to give. I, I know we should cheerfully give. But, man, I just don't. If I give, I won't have. And how is that going to get taken care of? Paul says this in verse 8. He says, and God is able to make all grace abound to you. Go ahead and give. God's got more. So that having all efficiency, sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. See here, you may abound in generosity. Uh, this guy named Laterno. Uh, he was a, a, a big wig in construction equipment uh, back in the day. He, he's got a university in Texas. Uh, he was a Christian man. And uh, as his company began to become successful, he determined that he would, uh, you know, take giving and being generous seriously. And so he would go way beyond, you know, a tenth or, you know, uh, even higher percentages to the point where as his company succeeded, uh, it was completely flipped. He was living off of 10% and giving away to various Christian organizations uh, 90% of his income. And someone came and says, Laterno, how can you do this? It's so crazy. How, how did this happen? And he says, well, listen. As God started blessing me, I, I started trying to shovel it back at him. And I've just, you know, committed to doing that with my life. And I've, I've tried to outgive God, but he's got a bigger shovel. 
Isn't that a great way of picturing it? I can trust God with this generosity because he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. It's all his. I can give knowing that he's more than enough. He quotes Psalm 112 in verse 9. I'm not going to read it here, but I encourage you to read Psalm 112. It's a great uh, roadmap for the, the life that honors God. And part of it is being generous. And that's why he quotes Psalm 112 in verse 9. But in verse 10, he, he gives us this, this last uh, affirmation. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase in the harvest of your righteousness. In other words, what Paul says, hey, man, the seed depot, God, will give you more seed. He who supplies your sowing will bring more and even multiply as you trust him and are generous with what he's given you. I was seeing that borne out in our lives, Eleanor and I, so many different times as we've learned the joy of giving. A few years back, we decided as a church we'd get out of debt. We did. Right, and we duck, we call that whole endeavor rise up. Anybody here for that one? I know many of you gave and made the four million dollars that we had to raise possible, and we did it in less than three years. Now we challenge everybody to give crazy, get crazy with the seed sow, right? Just and and just trust God. And so <laughs> I did what I thought was crazy. I prayed before Eleanor and I came together, and I said this number, and then Eleanor's Eleanor, and so she came with something that was around double what I had said. <laughs> And, uh, and I just trust that God's working through her heart and her faith. And so I said, all right. And just so you know, it was a crazy number. still is. It's a crazy number for someone who wants to continue to give what he's already giving, to give in addition to what they're already given this much for this project over three years. It just didn't make any financial sense. Unless God did something crazy, we weren't going to be able to give this amount of money. And so I did that kind of sheepish, okay, here we go. And we made our commitment, our pledge for that to happen. So that was like in May, and Christmas came. And we sat down at Christmas with her family. Uh, her mom was still alive. Her dad was there. Dad lives with us now. Um, they grew up in the Depression. They are terrific with money. And when I say terrific, they just don't spend it. They just don't spend on anything. Um, so uh, my dad's the guy who takes a pen knife at Christmas and slits the tape of the wrapping paper so that uh, he can take his bin that has wrapping paper from the decades, people. Like he has used wrapping paper throughout the years and he won't tear into it because that would be wasteful. And, and that's just the man that God made him to be. He's awesome. He's taught me so much about being a good steward. Um, but he's never, he and my mother had never really blown us away at Christmas. They gave us something, usually in a check. Anybody get checks from their parents, right? I don't know what you want. Here, go get it. And so uh, every year we get a card in our stocking, and it was there again. Uh, it was a card from the 70s. They had saved, you know, <laughs> blank cards from that era. And uh, I don't know if they crossed out, you know, their names that had been given to the, I don't know. But uh, it was a used card, right? And, and it was our check, and we just expected to roll it over and see the, you know, the $25, you know, for her and me or whatever it was. Uh, and we rolled it over, and it was 10 thousand dollars okay you say wow that doesn't even cover it because it never happened before and it's never happened since something happened in their financial world that it was time for them in their minds to disperse this amount of money to their three children and I was married to one of them okay and here's what did not happen when we opened that check we did not say Hawaii <laughs> No car. We didn't start spending it in our heads. Why? Because God had challenged us to, in a premeditated, cheerful plan, say, we're going to give this much. And it was immediate. We, we just both looked at each other, and we almost started crying. Because this was the jump start. There were other things that happened in that pledge that God brought in that wasn't there before. But this was the kicker, that two people who love us, loved us but had never been this level of generous with us on this Christmas, at this time, God said, give them this. And that was the funnest check I've ever written to a church. Because back, like I said earlier, it wasn't mine. It was easy. Here you go. God, thank you. Here you go. He 
He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase in the harvest of righteousness. We're going to talk about this with the rest of our time. The more than enough mindset. We'll talk about it next week. So I know you're like, we're done, right? Yes, we are. Uh, but here's the more than enough mindset before we go. God gives. We give. First priority. God multiplies. We just learned it. And instead of fear, our faith grows. God's generous. Are you? Uh, we'll close our services this way too. If you can just take your wallet, this is mine. It used to be a slim clip, now it's a tin in. It's a very nice wallet. Take yours out, put it in your hand just like me. If you've got a purse, ladies, you can hold that up, even if it's one of those steamer truck versions. <laughs> steamer trunk, I should say. Uh, if, if you're like totally digital and you're like, you know, I'm Apple Pay all the way, put your phone in your hand, however it works for you. I don't care. If it's Venmo, whatever. But just put whatever the, uh, the means by which you pay for things in your life uh, is. Put that in your hand. And here's our prayer. I'm going to keep my eyes open again. Don't get thrown off. But pray this with me, okay? We all praying? Here we go. Hold it up. Everybody got it? God in heaven, you don't have to say these words. Just pray them with me. Agree with me in your hearts. God in heaven, thank you. I'll pray that again, Father. Thank you for all that you've given me. I know I spent a lot of time thinking about what isn't, but there is so much that you've given me. There's so much that is. Thank you. And Lord, I want to take seriously the stewardship of what you've given me. Uh, thank you for your grace in that. And my, if, 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 you're, if you're someone who already gives, thank God for, your, for his grace to you and teaching you what he's taught you so far. But be willing. I pray this with you as a, as a fellow giver. Lord, I'm willing to learn how to give more and how to be more generous with the seed that I sow so that the harvest can be even more plentiful. Lead me in that, God. For those of us who are you know, just not in a position in our minds yet to give, Here's your prayer. God, teach me what it is to be generous and help me to start. Help me to start doing push-ups. Help me just to begin with a plan that will honor you with what you've given me. Uh, thanks again, Father. I pray this in Jesus' name. Hold it up one more time. and Everybody say amen. Amen. amen.